just a few levels in this trophic structure because as energy is moved between these levels, some of it is lost and is not available to do work. So the less energy you start with here, the fewer trophic levels you would have. So some have argued, well, if you started with more primary production, you could begin to add more of these uh, trophic levels simply because you're starting with more biomass of primary production. So that, that's kind of what we call a pr productivity hypothesis. There's more productivity, more trophic levels, well, that means more species. Okay? <clears throat> All right. The, the second hypothesis here <clears throat> might have to do with uh, speciation extinction. Which is why I wanted to talk to you a little bit about rarity and how species are formed and etc. So the speciation extinction hypothesis would say that the number of species that exist in a particular location is basically a combination of the rate at which new species have been formed over evolutionary time and the rate at which species have gone extinct over evolutionary time. If, during a period in Earth's history, the rate of speciation exceeds the rate of extinction, I would expect the number of species to increase in that area. On the other hand, if the rate of speciation is less than the rate of extinction, then we should experience a decrease in species in particular areas. And then we could ask, well, what sorts of things would influence the rates of speciation and the rates of extinction? Well, the rates of speciation uh, is a little more difficult, <laughs> a little more difficult to talk about uh, because we don't have a lot of the tools we would have if we were teaching an evolution course. But just in a very abstract way, what influences speciation? Well, the more species you have, right, the more species you could get, right, through hybridizations or through uh, <coughs> uh, the idea that more species present provides more niches for other species. In other words, the more species I have at the production level, that's more species can feed on those producers, which is more species can feed on those consumers. So you could make an argument that having a fair amount of species uh, can increase the rates of speciation beyond what we would expect. Right? Hybridization becomes possible. If you have a lot of closely related species, you could get these hybridization triangles that, that occur, etc. You could also have periods in, on the planet where uh, people talk about 700 million years ago as a time when organisms began to come out of the water, so, you know, animals and stuff, and as they come out of the water and then 450 million years ago the plants come out of the water, that you're exposed to ultraviolet light which may increase the mutation rate, and with increases in mutation rate that may increase the speciation rate. So, in kind of in a broad sense, we might have some notions as to why speciation rates might vary different points in evolutionary time. Um, the extinction part is probably a little bit easier to understand. Uh, we have had some events that have occurred on the planet that differ with latitude that have to do with uh, periodic cooling of the earth, right? We have these glacial periods uh, and these interglacials in between where things warm up and then it gets cold again for a glacial and then it gets warm again for interglacial and gets cold again for glacial. And these ice ages, <clears throat> you have these glaciers begin to move south in the northern hemisphere, they would move north in the southern hemisphere, but moving south across uh, land masses in the northern hemisphere. Well, with these ice ages, uh, the equator 
they're not getting these glaciers, right? The glaciers don't extend down into the equator. They extend down a little bit into North America. I think the last glacial event we had moved down into Pennsylvania and a little bit south, but it's not getting down into Florida and certainly not down into Mexico or Central America. So during these periods of time, we would have uh, these big extinction events because the glaciers are basically running over species that can't get out of the way, and the species that are able to move ahead of the glacier, I'm thinking like mammals or birds, they're all being pushed together into a smaller area on the planet that can support life. <clears throat> increasing competition, increasing extinction rates. That all makes sense to you. So the thinking is one hypothesis here has to do with these periods of time with high extinction rates and then as the glacier recedes, species recolonize but not all of them recolonize, and a bunch of them have been erased from the planet because of this glacier. So you have a period of high extinction in this part of the world, but not in the tropics. In which case, we've got more species in the tropics because they don't get these periodic intense disturbances like glaciers that basically erase species from the planet. Okay. <clears throat> That would also mean that uh, because the, the tropics haven't had these periods like this of high extinctions, <clears throat> they've had uh, a long time to accumulate species, whereas in our part of the world, we accumulate them, but we also erase them, right? So these uh, extinction events have reduced the number of species in the temperate zones, whereas they haven't reduced the number of species in the tropics. Okay? All right. All right. And then the last thing I want to go over is, well, <clears throat> kind of ways to test these hypotheses. Well, there's uh, good data on differences in uh, latitude with respect to species richness, these hypotheses all make a fair amount of sense. Uh, you also have communities where uh, they do exist at tropical latitudes, but they're islands, so they're sub subjected to that species area curve problem where the further away you are from a source of colonists, the less species you're going to accumulate. So, uh, I guess what I'm saying is at different spatial scales, we can alter this basic hypothesis that the closer you get to the tropics, you get more species. Well, it depends. I'm closer to the tropics here, but I would expect fewer islands here because that's an island and not a mainland. <clears throat> so kind of what's happening at these small spatial scales overwhelms these larger spatial scale patterns. I could also have keystone species in certain areas, in which case the keystone may affect what's happening at this location, and it may kind of alter these large-scale patterns that we expect to see. So the last thing I want to show you is uh, that even though there is this large-scale pattern of these increased number of species toward the equator, there are also these anecdotal locations on the planet that are referred to as biodiversity hotspots. That is, there are certain parts of the planet that have these insanely high numbers of species that don't fit these larger scale patterns that we're used to seeing. So in 2000, there were 25 biodiversity hotspots that were identified. All of these given by uh, these circles here. Uh, if you're interested, you can uh, look them up. It has a nice little website. You can click on these, and it talks a little bit about each of these habitats. Uh, but it's kind of interesting. I mean, we have a lot of biodiversity in California, even though it's at a high latitude, 
and it certainly has a lot more biodiversity than the same latitude on the eastern seaboard. So it isn't just latitude, there's something else going on here that helps to explain this. We do see a fair number of biodiversity hotspots that are around the equator, kind of what we would expect, but we're seeing some in California. There's a Mediterranean hotspot. Uh, what's the other one? Down here up the coast of Chile. There's one New Zealand has a tremendous number of, of species. So these hot spots tell us that we don't really understand all of what's going on because if we understood everything that was going on with species richness, we would be able to pull out a pattern from this. And currently a lot of this stuff is just very anecdotal. Right? We think that uh, the biodiversity hotspot off the coast of Chile here has to do with upwelling. That's a productivity gradient. <clears throat> upwelling brings nutrients up from the bottom of the ocean. It feeds the phytoplankton, gives you high primary production, which then allows or supports a lot of species in this area of the world. Okay. Does that make sense? Some of these, like Madagascar and New Zealand, it's probably their isolation that helped them maintain the species that they had, whereas events in Australia and Africa removed a lot of these same species. Okay. All right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop here, but uh, thanks for hanging in. I, I know this has been an insanely difficult semester for everybody. <clears throat> I know that the way that I, I put together the syllabus at the beginning of the semester, because I've gone to take-home exams, has made things a little bit more difficult for you at the end of the semester. I tried to do exam three a little bit lighter and I'll make the final exam a little bit lighter than I did say exam two which was a take home. Uh, <clears throat> I hope to see you all in the hallways, those of you that are coming back in the fall, I hope to see you. If you're uh, graduating, best of luck to you. Sorry I didn't get to say goodbye. Uh, and. Uh, Good luck with everything that you do, and those of you that are headed back to Gannon in the fall, keep my fingers crossed. I hope we're in a classroom, uh, because uh, it's a lot easier on me, and I know it's a lot easier on you. Uh, please don't forget to do student evaluations. If you could do those, that would be great. And uh, I look forward to reading the, the rest of your work through the rest of the semester, and uh, enjoy your summer. All right, take care. Bye.